hi and welcome to this community learning session we've called this one caring for aging family and you can tell by my beautiful guests on the panel you are in for a treat tonight with miss carol embry and gloria black now Car uh, carol let me tell you she spent many years as a palliative care nurse and as well she has experience as a caregiver with her family members that she has been a blessing in their life as uh, they went through various illnesses and Miss Gloria the same. Um, she's been a caregiver to many and through the stories that you're going to hear from her and all the things we have to learn, well, I believe that you will see. We are, we are definitely in for a treat tonight. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'll, I'll introduce myself. I don't have a whole lot to offer except I'm the host. <laughs> and welcome. I'm so glad that you're taking some time to join us tonight. I, I do want to tell you how this particular session, how I roped these ladies in and how this came to be. Um, at church, while this is a community learning session, it ties to a series that we were doing at church, Family Strong. And in that, we were looking at all the dimensions of family, and many of them I really understood. You know, parenting, okay, I get that, and being a sibling, being a wonderful daughter, I, I understand that. But when we began to look at aging parents, how to love them well, how to honor them, really how to care well, well, I thought, you know what? I don't really feel very equipped in that area. So we begin conversations. I've learned so much, and I can tell you, if you just get even a tidbit of the good stuff that I learned from these ladies, this night will be worthwhile. So welcome, I, I hope that you enjoy your time. Let me tell you, as we, as we're gonna talk about lots of good things here, I'm gonna give them most of the night, they'll have the floor, but as we close, I'm gonna share with you the top 10 things that I learned in our time together. But of course, I'll give the ladies the last word. We're gonna have some fun, grab a cup of tea, be prepared to learn and, uh, and have a great time. And don't forget, um, you are able, if you're watching this on Facebook, you can throw down a question. We are gonna try to take a few minutes for Q&A at the end. So if you have a question or comment, well, well, we'll take some time for that if we are able, unless we get too Gabby. What do you think, <laughs> girls? We'll do our best. So we'll see what happens. Now, let's, let's begin. As we, as we look at uh, our family members and as they age, well, we're all aging, um, there will come a time where we need some help. And as I, was, as I was saying here, I read a quote that said, family members are by far the number one source of long-term long care support for older adults. Mm -hmm, so sure. it's, it's gonna happen. The family at some point is gonna need to step in. It's gonna be new things to learn, mm -hmm. new conversations to have, so many new things to juggle and understand. So, mm -hmm. so we're gonna get into that. And, and I know there's gonna be things that their experiences and their tips and tricks, they're really gonna help. So we're gonna kind of start at the beginning. Um, let me start with you, Carol. As what are some of the early things in the day-to-day -day life of a family member that you might begin to notice? What, what are kind of the first things? I think um, probably one of the first things I would notice with my family and with other families that I've seen is the ability to um, function in the kitchen, oh. like to get a meal ready and uh, they can't think about what to have and they're asking you like, what should I have? And you say, well, what do you like? But they can't even think about that. And if they have home care coming in, they have to know the night before to take meat out of the freezer and those mm. kind of things. They can't think that far ahead. So that's one of the first things I've noticed in my own particular family. And then I think the other one is their walking, mm -hmm. where you know, they're not as steady as they once were. So you want to be sure they're safe. So it's, it's a little bit scary mm -hmm. that if they're there living by themselves, um, those kind of things, eh? Mm -hmm. What you found, Gloria? Yeah. I think with a man, it's really totally different. Yeah. He's probably not used to being in the kitchen a whole lot, and uh, you're gonna notice his difficulty with using tools and repairing things like he did all his life, and now all of a sudden, it's a, it's a puzzle to him. And it takes you a while to catch on to that. You, yeah. you don't realize that's happening for a while, but uh, those things show up more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, that. we talked about, yeah, things like maintenance, mm -hmm. things like uh, transportation or even managing things, complex yeah. things that stuff that takes complex thinking. Yes. And mm -hmm. even basic things like right. getting dressed, getting like dressed, figuring right. out what to wear and, uh, 
And of course, then bathing in those things, you're scared they're going to fall, mm -hmm. getting, they mm -hmm. maybe always had a tub bath or a shower, and now you're watching them to make sure they're safe, and mm -hmm. they, need, they need guidance, they need somebody there, but you have to be respectful of them and not take away all right. of their... And again, their, with, yeah. some, with some folks, that's not a problem at all. Yeah. They could still dance on ice and come back standing <laughs> on their feet. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, uh, mobility is we're not all, an issue. We're all different. Right. Yeah. There are, Everybody's different. Yeah. And that, that's a good, a good segue into safety because for some, the safety might be mobility. It might mm -hmm. be really nervous about tripping or falling, yeah. but there's others, maybe they're, like you say, mobility is not an issue, but right. maybe driving. Yeah, right driving or something something mm -hmm. else might be more of a safety concern. Right. And then you need to know who to get involved with that if it's driving. Mm -hmm. Right. Perhaps you have to get your doctor to to mm -hmm. tell them, have a little chat with them and say you really can't drive anymore. Mm -hmm. They don't want to hear it from their family right. for mm -hmm. sure. And you don't want to be the bad guy all the time coming up with all of these things. So I think that's where we tend mm -hmm. to call the family doctor and say, you know, mm -hmm. and need again, to do this. I'm not trying to argue with you, Carol, but <laughs> again... Let's have a good conversation. <laughs> I think she I is. Told she was going to be fun. Again, sometimes people realize it themselves and they will ask you to drive mm -hmm. in certain situations. Yes. If they'll feel comfortable, they'll drive, but then they'll say, do you mind driving now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so it varies. It's so yeah, different with every is. person. Everybody's, right. everybody's different. Mm -hmm. yeah. we are, we're all individuals. Mm -hmm. So we're talking, and that's a great point even as we begin. These are examples, ideas. Mm -hmm. it's one safety concern, one activity to the next. It's, it's all going to be a bit different based yeah, on the person. Sure. But we start to see activities begin to begin. Some activity begins to be a challenge. Yeah. Some safety concerns kind of begin to, to take place. And, and kind of, you, you mentioned the stove one time to me. I thought that was really yes, interesting. Yes, that you, I know I, I had a relative who constantly forgot to turn the stove off. And that was one of the first things mm -hmm. her family noticed, mm -hmm. that she was leaving it on and burning the pot and different things. And that she'd been a cook her whole life, and mm -hmm. she still was trying to do that, mm -hmm. baking mm -hmm. bread and everything. Mm -hmm. But she was in her early 90s, and finally mm -hmm. the family had to say, they were actually putting things on the stove and turning the stove off in the, uh, the power bar. Mm -hmm. in, the, oh, okay. in the apartment building. Wow. Right. So, and other people were then doing the mm -hmm. cooking for her. But not an easy leaving thing. Leaving the tap running is another, yeah. another thing you notice too. So you guys are kind of just saying you, you need to begin to watch right. and mm -hmm. pay attention mm -hmm. and different little things might come up. Mm -hmm. What about medical? Medical issues and health, you know, health related concerns? That, that we've talked about a well, little bit. I think if they're on any kind of medication, sometimes they will forget to take them. Mm -hmm. Or you'll, if, you know, the ideal is to get them a blister pack, get mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. through the pharmacy so they have those. But even then, I mean, sometimes you'll look at them and they'll have taken the wrong day. You know, it's not Sunday, but Sundays mm -hmm. is all gone. And you think, oh dear. And then you look and you say, okay, so they just missed a whole, did they miss a whole day or did they take those plus another day? So then you're kind of looking through to see if there's another day missing. Mm -hmm. But those little things you just, and you don't want to take their away their independence altogether mm -hmm. because right, that's not right either. So, so you, have to like be, you have to be so careful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Paying attention, mm -hmm. but not being too quick. No. Right. And, and Gloria, I remember when we were talking about this too, you said as you watch for medical things, even things like I never imagined but toes. Sure. I mm -hmm. thought that was interesting. <laughs> yes. When the person is uh, having a bath or something and you are the person who does the toe care, mm -hmm. well, you just watch and make sure they don't have any sores or mm -hmm. you know something that needs attended to. Yes. Yeah. Because many times they won't recognize pain. No. They won't realize that, that sore. And some things can get missed like that. Mm -hmm. So there's got to have sharp eyes. <laughs> Keep an eye out for everything. Don't you find older people too, they have a different pain threshold. Yes. Mm -hmm. They've been through a lot in their lives. So what we would maybe say, oh, I've got a headache or something. I would never they say would that. They would never mention that ever. <laughs> that would not come out of their mouths. So yeah, they're, it's very different. So. And, and you, you talked about knowing your family. like. 
knowing if you have somebody who is going to not complain about pain, maybe yeah. you have to be watching closer. Right on. Right. So that's right. something I picked up in some yeah. of our conversations, like mm -hmm. really knowing. Mm. Well, in addition to some of this, we also made note here on there's there's um, financial and legal things that begin, you know, there's <laughs> there's their activities and then, uh, you know, there's the, the safety, there's medical, but then there's also the business, the business end of things. Right. Um, Gloria, what are a couple of things that you need to be thinking of in that side, on the financial and, and legal side? Okay, well, particularly if the person is an individual without a spouse with them. Mm -hmm. You need to have some other family members step up to be mm -hmm. their uh, substitute health care uh, decision maker mm -hmm. in case it comes to the, it wouldn't be at that point right now, but down the road it might come to the case where that person can't make health decisions. So you need to have a family member mm -hmm. willing to take on that job. Mm -hmm. And again, you need to have uh, the enduring power of attorney. And these are usually done up by a lawyer and um, the person that you're appointing mm -hmm. is there with you and they can take care of finances. Yeah. Awesome. There's a, there's a lot. I know that uh, when my daughter worked in palliative, she talked about the importance of those mm -hmm. documents, the enduring power of attorney and the substitute decision maker, that we should have those in place way before we They're, might ever need them. Right. Mm -hmm. So important. Yeah. Right. And then there's the housing stuff. All of a sudden becomes important to address around the home. Who wants to take that one, Carol? What are your thoughts? Well, just can they stay in their home? Like, are mm -hmm. they able mm -hmm. to be there? If do they have a family member that is able to be with them, or can they get enough care? Like mm -hmm. enough care from continuing care. Um, either way, they. You can't just quit and say you have to go. <laughs> they, I mean, they have to be a part of the whole decision. Mm -hmm. in, in that case, you'd need a whole family meeting. Mm -hmm. Get all the family members right. together and, and say what is best, what we think is best. Mm -hmm. And then it's not always going to be easy, and they're not always going to do what, what we think is best. So, right. But if all the family members can get together, and, and as you were saying, Gloria, they have to be know that they're able to do it. Not That's everybody right. is. Have to be honest about it. We have it. to be truthful. And I look at this through rose-colored glasses because through all my caregiving, I've had a mountain, a family behind me. Children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Yeah. Yeah. Shout and, out to Gloria's family. <laughs> <laughs> toot, toot. <laughs> and, and my siblings, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. with my mom, uh, my brother, was there looking after her in her own home, running yeah. in and out, make sure her fire was on and you know everything was safe for her yeah. mm -hmm. until it was time for her to come to our home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it makes, so. a, makes a big difference oh, if yes. you've got the family support. And uh, I know when I, jam. when I looked after mom, if I wanted to go on a vacation, then my older sister would come home and she'd, wherever she was, she would come home for a couple of weeks. And right and then I would have the break so mm -hmm. and you have to be aware of those things you need we all need each other we can't no. we can't do it alone that's for sure I there are that. many good resources to yes. reach out to mm -hmm. if you don't have family around mm -hmm. and there are people who don't mm -hmm. or if the family are honest enough to say look I just can't do this yeah. mm -hmm. and they need to step up and say that yeah I remember that impacting me Gloria when we spent some time together um, kind of going over this, and you said the, the main point is that the person gets the best care. Right. And while it might fall to you as a family member, sometimes it might not be the mm -hmm. best care for them. So every family is different, um, and everybody has to make the best decision for the loved one to get the best care mm -hmm. that, that they need. Mm -hmm. And this does take a family meeting, and it does, it does take some work and some time and and you guys have taught me you know it takes a lot of listening mm -hmm. because it's not only about what i might think as i begin to see my mom or my dad struggle with activities or need adjustments in their house to keep them safe or their medications it's not only about what my viewpoint is it's how they want to live out mm -hmm. their life alive and well and so it's listening to their needs it's, it's sharing our concerns, 
and it's all of that together. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So I know that those family meetings, um, I've actually not had to experience one, mm -hmm. but I can imagine there's, it, they're tough. They're, they're tough things to sort mm -hmm. out, um, but, but it takes listening on both ends and understanding. And uh, we should emphasize that the person who's being cared for should be involved in those Absolutely. meetings. Absolutely. Yes. They to should be there. To listen to them mm -hmm. and understand where their needs are. And, and you also mentioned uh, a point, too. If, if, uh, if you're making a decision as a family maybe to take in a parent and, and you're married, that's a, that's a married couple decision. Mm -hmm. Right. And so there's a lot of factors. We don't want to jump on things. We don't want to presume on anyone, not our own spouse, not the family member. It just really takes listening mm -hmm. and working as mm -hmm. a family team. And I certainly picked that up through some yeah. of the conversations just... that we've had. Okay. Um, one thing we did when we were talking about housing, and I found this interesting, if you start to notice that maybe there's some concerns about your house and the safety of the of the loved one in the home, mm -hmm. you suggested uh, an, an, yeah. an occupational therapy to right. come in and do an assessment. And all they do, they walk around, mm -hmm. they see everything, and decide what can make it safer, like right. bars in the bathroom mm -hmm. and, and uh, taking the mats off the floor, all of those things. But they have wonderful ideas and it really keeps people in their home right a right. lot of times just by doing a lot of those things and sometimes we don't think of that we think you know right. mm -hmm. if you can't walk we'll call physiotherapy and get them to do exercises but ot is really great for right. mm -hmm. for that kind of thing and it's it's always available so yeah i thought that was good because i'm just thinking maybe someone like me we would jump oh you can't do this this is you know, this is going to mean this has to happen, and I would over, uh, you know, estimate my own knowledge. But hey, call a professional, yeah. right. and they know all the supports that yeah. I might not realize exactly. that could actually, you know, help. Yeah. So don't just jump. You know, yeah. like use all the resources, do all the talking. Absolutely. Um, and and I think our point in all that is that we want to make sure that as our loved ones age, that that we that we go through the process well right. and as a team and understanding Gloria said it it's not a cookie cutter every mm -hmm. family and every person in a family in yeah. every situation it's going to it's going to take some maneuvering yeah well i want to take a minute now to jump into a discussion on dementia it's affected a lot of us um, maybe many of you out there listening and and uh, as we talked about this, um, I, I really learned a lot. To, uh, Gloria had a lot of good things to share about dementia. Um, Gloria, why don't you just kind of give, I'll give you the floor. Why don't you just start with some things that you think are important to share about the topic of, of caring for someone sure. with dementia? Sure. Well, first of all, dementia is a wide field. Mm. So many different kinds of dementia. And they're presented so differently with each person. There's no set way to deal with no. each and every one. And um, people will ask you questions, did this happen? And you say, no, that didn't happen to my loved one that mm -hmm. had dementia or my sister-in-law who had it or so on. So uh, you, each one has to be dealt with very differently and step by step. And you call on all the resources you have in your <laughs> head, everything you've ever read, everything you've ever <laughs> heard. And you need to be a real good problem solver. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to uh, think t to yourself, oh, oh, now maybe that would work in this situation. So try it. If it doesn't work, scrap it and <laughs> ask for help and, yeah. and see what else you can do. And try again. That's right. And you said, although it is all different, there were some things that you found were common. Yes. And, and some tips that you learned along the way from various people that you picked up while right. not everyone helped everything, there were some really good ones. Right. Yes. So share, hey, we, yeah. we got some we good ones. We both learned a lot from Yeah, that. we were like, write that down. I have them written down in case you forget, but I'll give you the floor. <laughs> one, thing, one thing that seems to be really common, what well, has been with any people I have uh, been with, is um, wanting to go back home, mm -hmm. needing to help mother and father and needing to be in their home, which means their childhood home. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like where they are now, that's really not home to them. Mm -hmm. And if they're still in their own home that they've lived in for 50 years, 
they still want to step back and go and visit with yeah. mom and mm -hmm. dad who in many cases have been gone for mm -hmm. years. Another thing that we laughed about and talked <laughs> about was um, uh, someone looking in the mirror because it's hard to understand but they don't see as we see mm -hmm. um, when the brain starts to become cloudy mm -hmm. they see things quite differently so many times and they look in the mirror and they see this old person in there they think who's in my house <laughs> who's that person? who is that yeah. and then many times the mirror gets a big shake and <laughs> and when this scary. goes on you begin to think oh, oh somebody's going to get hurt here and Luckily for me, I had, uh, my friend had mentioned years and years before that they had to paper over the mirrors. So we quickly got newspapers and the funny papers, that was a good one, yeah. and just, just papered all the mirrors over. And Super cool. That's probably why you saw me going with my hair not so nice and all that <laughs> stuff. <laughs> that's but awesome. that certainly helped, yeah. wow. you know. Then that was a fear that was a little bit less you'd still see a reflection in a window or something mm -hmm. like that and see that fear. Yeah. How cool is that? I, yeah. thought, I found that really interesting. It's like they still see themselves as being a younger, oh, a yes. young person. Yeah. They're not yeah. that old person. And that's and why they're thinking about their mom and dads are going mm -hmm. home. They see a young person. Right. And then all of a sudden, they look in the mirror. And it's not and them. Who it's, is that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get that mm -hmm. person out of my house. Right. <laughs> and, and you talked about the table. Oh yes. Oh yes. Um, many times we like to set up our table just with a whole lot of dishes and a whole lot of utensils <laughs> and um, condiments and and um, the sugar bowl and the milk pitcher and everything. It comes to the point that that is confusing mm -hmm. to a person with dementia. It's really they look at that sea of things yeah. and they don't know what to take or what to do. So reduce it down to become very simple. Mm -hmm. In some cases, it's a plate or a bowl and a tablespoon works very best. Yes. Forks, knives, and that sort of thing, are uh, they become so, it's difficult to cut things, yeah. so you help them with it's that. It's too yeah. much. And make it's sure you always sit and eat with them, yes. and you have your bone spoon too. Yes. I just find that so honoring that I, I never would have known that, yeah. but make it simple for somebody so they don't have to struggle. That's Right. And and that's fan like that's fantastic. And that's gonna help somebody else. Mm -hmm. That's right. I'm sure because I yeah. Yeah. I had I had never table, thought of that. Those were good. Yeah. When you see that hurt in their eye, oh. yeah. that hurt is confusion mm -hmm. and fear. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you told me to watch their face. Mm -hmm. Watch and read. And that's then right. try to problem solve what what is the issue and uh, be really be really tuned into that. Right. And you also shared some technology that yes. Carol and I thought was super interesting. Some of the things that you learned that can help people with dementia to, to live. That's right. Still have can some freedom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, I have a family who keep their ears on to everything that's new that's coming <laughs> up in the world. And uh, so we had a pocket finder, which is, it looks sort of just like a little cell phone. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I just said, that's your cell phone, fasten it on your belt. And then I had my iPhone and I could watch. And my husband was free to roam the land and go yeah. where he enjoy wanted to life. go and enjoy his life and feel some freedom. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that was, you know, in the beginning. And uh, we live on a farm, so that was pretty easy to do. He could travel and go and do the things he was used to doing. Yeah. That's, I and I would know wonderful. where he was. Mm -hmm. I might be here in town at a meeting or something. So I look at my phone. Oh, okay. Well, he's back in the back 40s. That's okay. He's <laughs> safe. <laughs> I, I just think that's awesome. Yeah. Just using technology to allow people, um, you know, to live. That's and, right. And to do the things they love. Their independence. Keep, mm -hmm. keep as much independence as long as possible. Mm -hmm. And the deadbolt. Yes. <laughs> right. You said right. that. I never heard tell of such a thing. Never did I, I, I learned so much. <laughs> Some people are not wanderers. No. Right. Other people are. They decide mm -hmm. they want to go someplace. Yeah. Well, they just open the door and go. That's fine in the daytime because you're awake and alert and mm -hmm. you can watch where they're going and so forth. But at night, 
sometimes there are some people who sleep pretty soundly. <laughs> so that would become a fear that, that your, loved one, <laughs> your loved one would get outside get, at away. night. Yep. So I happened to say to my sons, well, can you turn that dead bolt around so that the button is on outside and the key is on the inside? And they looked at me and they said, mother, I think <laughs> you could buy such a thing. You can buy what would, you would put in where the deadbolt goes, and you need a key on both sides. Super cool. That's all that problem. Yeah. Super cool. You just make sure you keep the key. Yeah. You're just lucky you had a smart family. <laughs> Absolutely. Gloria's family getting all the love tonight. If you know Gloria's <laughs> family, put it in the comments. They're awesome. Send them some love tonight. And the camera. You had a really neat story about a camera for remote viewing. I that guess would be just my phone. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That you were a, that somebody could set up um, if and watch their family or be able to check in on family when they were somewhere else with a camera. That's just on the pocket phone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everybody okay. could do it on their cell That's phones really cool. as long as they had it programmed in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So there's lots of cool technology and and lots of uh, neat things um, that we talked about and and you covered most of them here, Gloria, tonight. Um, asking for help, I know, can be hard. Um, and we all feel the weight when it falls to us. I, I know, I know, I would feel the same, and others do. So when it comes to asking for help and needing supports, um, let's go to you, Carol. Um, what What do you want to say to somebody who's feeling like you know what? This is my my responsibility. I've got to deal with this. But you know what? They they need yeah. to share the load. Yeah, they, mm -hmm. you you can't do it by yourself. You need to right. reach out to your family and then to the resources in the community like that's what they're there for mm -hmm. and um, i know when i was caring for my mom my family were away but because we needed to hire somebody we didn't have any community support in there at the time they supplied the money to do that because they couldn't wow. be there every month they would they would pay somebody to be there and I didn't even know what they were paying until a long time later. Mm -hmm. I just knew I never had to pay. It was mm -hmm. always wow. them. I was the caregiver in the home, mm -hmm. but they were all providing for me Resources and for my, my, for my mom mm -hmm. in that case um, by paying for somebody to be there mm -hmm. so that I could work a few days mm -hmm. and, and go on with my life a bit. So, mm -hmm. And it was the same person pretty much all the time. So that mm. was easy too because she just became a family member. Yeah. yeah. And then in other cases, I would advise people if they don't have that kind of support, definitely um, get into continuing care. Call them, get some help in the home. And there's lots of it out there. It's right. just a matter of finding it. And, and even community people, your friends and family, they all want to help. They don't know what to do. And they'll, they'll say to you, I, I would come and help, but I don't know mm -hmm. what to do. So just do a bit of teaching. If, mm -hmm. it's, if it's somebody coming in the home that is willing to do it, just right. show them the ropes a little bit. You know? right. And we did mention of keeping a diary thing. Yes. Like if someone comes in to care for your loved one, have them just write a little note in a book yeah. as you would as a mother and you went out and left someone looking after your child, you wrote some little hints down, like he goes to bed at such and such and he likes. Isn't and that cool? you do the same kind of thing with a, a person who's needing care. Mm -hmm. um, you write down what's happened in the morning, and that person will write what's happened while you've been away. Exactly. So when you come home, you, you can yeah. read through that and know what's going on. Again, I thought that was such a fantastic tip. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't have thought about, but how it makes total sense when you're, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, when you're going out with, as a getting a babysitter um, to help. But it, it really makes good sense. Mm -hmm. You guys talked a lot about um, trying to get the same person, mm -hmm. yeah. trying to keep it consistent, and 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 making sure there's some communication. But I also appreciated in our conversation where you talked about, you know, it's important that you stay strong and healthy. That you that you can only be a good care caregiver when you have the energy to do it. Mm -hmm. And if you weigh yourself down with too much guilt or like it's all on me and I won't ask for help or, um, and when you talked about getting one so that you could have a night out with your husband, mm -hmm. if you don't do that, you fall apart, your marriage falls apart and, and none of that's gonna help in the end. No. So really we need to just recognize that 
asking for help is is smart and it's wise. Well, I didn't. You. I you didn't, didn't. I didn't get out with my husband. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's fair. And, and I wouldn't loan you mine. <laughs> I know you wouldn't. All you guys listening out there, if you want her phone number, uh, oh, whoops, I didn't say that. Okay, and on to our next topic. <laughs> Something I should throw in there too that if you're using. Um, community or you know VON mm -hmm. or someone to come in um, I know myself I went for quite a few years thinking that um, no no I couldn't do that because I would have to pay them the same as I would pay an individual mm -hmm. well I might as well had an individual I knew until my brother looked into it and said this mm -hmm. has nothing to do with your income this is to do with mom's income yeah and so then they said certainly they would provide somebody to come in. I think it was two hours a week or something like that, mm -hmm. or two hours, two different days, yeah. so right. we could get out together. And um, when they, they said, well, we could send, and I won't name her, but they said we could send this certain person. And I said, are you kidding me? My mom knows her and loves her. <laughs> so she mm. came. Yeah. each week and it, it was a joy mom looked yeah. forward to her yes. coming yeah that's what the an, thing what an encouragement if you were listening to this and sitting on the fence and carrying the load you don't know what could work out how much better you'll feel and and just the doors that'll open when you ask for help mm -hmm. and uh, a way will be made well i do want to take a little turn um from dementia and go you know to when we're going to take a few minutes to talk with carol now about about dying and Carol, you spent so many years in palliative care. Mm -hmm. Not everyone is even familiar with the term, so why don't you give us the definition. What is palliative care? Palliative care is the care for anyone facing, um, who has a life-threatening illness, mm -hmm. and probably there's not a cure in sight. And often people think it's cancer, mm -hmm. but it's anything. It's more than cancer. Mm -hmm. It's more, you could have a stroke, you could have a heart condition. It's anything that is life-threatening and probably no cure in sight. And it involves a, a big group of people. It's, mm -hmm. it's a team effort. There's a whole team of people mm -hmm. um, in palliative care. So um, you have a doctor, you have the palliative care consult nurse, which I was, and then you have the VON, home care, um, occupational therapy, dietitian. A lot of these people were people we called when needed. They mm -hmm. wouldn't be part of the team on the day-to-day -day basis. But they could be pulled in but as you resources pull them as in as needed. There was yeah. a clergy on the team mm -hmm. I was on, mm -hmm. and um, and pharmacist on the team. Um, so you you called in whoever you needed. But there was a basic team that, mm -hmm. and we met once a week mm -hmm. to discuss every patient so that we could give them the best possible care. So uh, palliative care isn't just the last few days at the hospital. No, no, and it's not just hospital. Right. Uh, palliative care is wherever you choose to be, wherever the family chooses mm -hmm. to be. And often you hear hospice care. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. palliative hospice are interchangeable. Mm -hmm. right. So like in England and the States, they only talk uh, uh, hospice. Mm -hmm. We're, as we say both, we'll okay. often say. And, um, but yeah, it's care. And it's, it's for every part of the body, it's your physical, your spiritual, your emotional, your financial, all of those things are addressed in palliative care. And you, I mean, you take time to know your patient, first of all. Mm -hmm. And the important, one of the most important things I would say is to listen, to go in and sit down and really listen. Often you'll get a consult and you'll go to the hospital and see somebody, or you maybe Give it, give it a consult to go to somebody's home. Mm -hmm. And so you go there and you spend a quite a bit of time and talk to them and just listen and get a feeling for where they are and how they're feeling. And uh, you don't start talking about dying and all of those things. No. You just, you, first of all, you have to get to know them and they have to get to know mm -hmm. you. And mm -hmm. they build a trust mm -hmm. when they know you. And not everybody wants to have a palliative care nurse come and visit them. Mm -hmm. I've had families who say to me, we dearly want you to go visit mom, but please don't say you're a palliative care nurse. Wow. She sees you in the corridor, she already likes you, <laughs> but don't tell her what you do. Mm -hmm. So uh, you go in and you kind of play the game and you get this, they get the same care, they just don't have to have it. And I would never wear my name tag then mm -hmm. when I would do that. I would just mm -hmm. go in and sit down and, and uh, but just listen to what they're telling you. And eventually they'll get around to it. 
and that's right and so you, you do you do get to the point where you um, as the palliative care team understand their wishes for dying yes and that's really important once you once you establish trust and uh, everything then you get down to the nitty-gritty like mm -hmm. what do you want and who do you want it from and what you might often ask them a question like um, do you have a spiritual advisor because it's really important and mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. they are Catholic we need to get somebody in to do the sacrament of the sick so we mm -hmm. have to kind of closely monitor that and if as we feel it's getting closer call the priest and have them mm -hmm. come in but for any other religion we, they need to know that there is somebody available. If their own pastor can't come, we, the guy on the team, whoever was on the team, I say guy, but it's also <laughs> ladies. And uh, we had a couple of ladies on our team at different times. And they would go to the homes with us, or they would go to the hospital and visit the patients. And uh, so that was really important. And then the next part is about, about their wishes for dying. Mm -hmm. And they may say, I really want to be at home. So you do everything to get them home if they're in hospital. If they're at home, then you put all the services in you can possibly put in. Tell them where things are available, like the Red Cross, you can borrow things. And you realize that yourself, and if you don't, the VON do. They'll mm -hmm. tell you they should have a bed, they should have a commode, mm -hmm. they should have. And so you provide all those things for them to make mm -hmm. it possible mm -hmm. for them to be at home. And then the VON will go in and, and teach them how to do the medications, teach the family right. how to do the medications. And because we can't all be there all the time, but mm -hmm. so that's a very crucial. And the relationship between the palliative care consult nurse and the VON and the continuing care people is really important because we need to be in touch with each other mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. And with the doctor, we, any of us can call the doctor but often they want you to because you're mm -hmm. right there at the hospital perhaps with them. So um, those relationships are really important. And I, I know I asked Carol, maybe feeling a bit naive in this discussion when we were preparing, and I said, well, I would think that there'll be time when maybe I or a child, you know, dealing with a parent might feel like, uh, I want you to go to the hospital, and or you need to go to the hospital, but their wish might be to stay at home. So I naively asked the question, like, what about when you don't agree? Like, what do you do then? Mm -hmm. And I found it very encouraging that you reminded me, again, that if that's their wishes, we have to honor their wishes, right. and that you would be surprised. What I might not realize, maybe going through it a first time, would be with all the supports in place, yes, yes. with all the things that can be put together, that a plan can find its way forward. Yes. Even if at the beginning, uh, I, as a child or something, I couldn't see it. Mm -hmm. and, and so I felt that, you know, you really, through the process of that preparing for the expected death at home mm -hmm. and learning about it, I think if the more that we learn and understand all those pieces, I think we can maybe find ways to work better together yes. with our family than, than maybe our initial reaction mm -hmm. would be like worry, fear, like, oh, mom, dad, you know, you can't handle this. I'm scared. Yeah. I want you to go to the, like, you know, and, and I felt even just in our conversation, some of that just being relieved mm -hmm. to know that mm, even if you don't agree and, you know, things work out, yes. plans come together. And I think the, the other thing about palliative care is it's not just the patient. The whole family is the unit of care. Mm -hmm. right. So whoever is in that family, if they're in Vancouver or Toronto, wherever, we are in touch with them all mm -hmm. the time. And they have the ability to call us at any time oh, mm -hmm. to get an update. And so we have this booklet that's called uh, Preparing for the Expected Death at Home. And in that, at the back of it, is the DNR, which is do not resuscitate. And almost every patient who is at home will have this signed, either by the doctor or by the patient themselves. Mm -hmm. And this, some people keep them on their fridge, other people do not want everybody to see it. <laughs> so it's on their chart, on top of the, on top of the uh, fridge usually, that yeah, seems right. to be the best place. <laughs> And also there's uh, another little copy here that's important phone numbers. You know yourselves if you're stressed 
And you can't think can't of think your, of your own, own phone, phone number that's right. or, your, or your best friend's yes. number. So we write them all here, like your family doctor, the care team, everybody on it, mm -hmm. the clergy, and the funeral director. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a question I would typically, after this is all planned, I would ask them, like, where do you plan to be? What funeral home? Mm -hmm. And when they tell me then, or whoever, we would call that funeral home, make the arrangement and say, this is an expected death at the home. DNR is in the home. We will get you the death certificate at the time, and they will say, fine, call me when it happens. It saves all these calls going to the hospital. You go to the, the funeral director comes directly to the home, and the family are so relieved that they mm -hmm. haven't had to do all of that. But people don't know that. Mm -hmm. And even, even with all of this in place, I can tell you, there have been insta instances where people have been so stressed they would forget about that and they just call 911. Mm -hmm. And you can understand that. If somebody's dying mm -hmm. in front of you, especially mm -hmm. somebody First you're very time, close yeah. to, you think, oh my goodness, what mm -hmm. can I do? And that's, you know, so then, you know what happens? The fire department comes, the ambulance mm -hmm. comes, and sometimes the police, and it's what could have been so perfect is not. It becomes but right. it is, traumatic. It yeah. is what it is, and you mm -hmm. just go with that. That's, that's all it is. But, uh, and the other thing about being at home, the family has the option, or the patient. Sometimes they've told you all along, I want to be at home. And then you'll go in and they'll say, you know what, I think I should go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And that's perfectly fine. That's okay. And that's what you say. That's fine. Mm -hmm. We'll just call and make the arrangements and that's it. You do it. So it's whatever's best for them. So. And mm -hmm. I know you shared some, some tips on how to best honor people that are palliative. I'll uh, share them and you guys can unpack them if there's any further comments. But you said set up their room to speak to who they are. That's mm -hmm. right. Not, not, you know, you, you come in and see who they are in that moment, but they, they had a yeah. whole life um, that represents who they are. So let their room and their space um, represent that. Let their pictures do the yeah. talking. Show pictures of what they love. Talk about them and listen to them. And I remember, Carol, you told me, um, if you're seeing someone in a palliative, you know, give them 100% attention. Yes. Phones Set. off. Stuff away. Don't sit down. Don't stand at a doorway and talking. Go in and sit down. Honor them. Mm -hmm. Honor them with your time and attention. And the other thing I would say that's nothing to do with that, but patients often have pets. And I've had so many people that I've gone in to visit them at home, and the dog comes here guarding the patient, you know. <laughs> and they'll say, I'm sorry, but it's just like a guard dog. And so I've, I've learned that really early on that they need to say goodbye too. So uh -huh. I remember going to the hospital with this one gentleman whose dog always guarded him. And I said to his son, I think the dog should come in. And of course they said, the dog? And I said, yeah. So I went to the gentleman and I said, would you like to see your dog? He said, can I? And I said, absolutely. So they brought the dog in. The mm. dog got up and laid on the bed with him. And they each got to say goodbye. Mm -hmm. And you could see it. I mean, wow. and I said to him a couple of days later, would you want the dog to come back? And he said, no, that's fine. We said our goodbyes. So, but I know I love pets. So <laughs> <laughs> I, knew that, I knew that would be important to me. Right. Yep. And since then, I had a bird in there one time, a lady whose mother had a bird. We <laughs> brought it in in the cage, closed the door, wouldn't let anybody in, and let it fly around and sit on her shoulder for a while. Oh, that's mm -hmm. so And then touching. she got the board and went back. Now, I don't know if you'd be able to do that during COVID. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. So uh, this is years ago when I worked. <laughs> don't and tell them I... at the hospital that they can bring birds. <laughs> May I jump in yes. here? Yes. Uh, we've been talking about the elderly and sometimes sad to Good say mm. that we have Thank palliative you. care for young people. Very mm -hmm. often. And um, with that, again, the room needs to be set up to be them. Yes. Yep. Yep. And when you visit, you need to be on their yep. level yes. and with them and have the room open for their friends and uh, make sure yeah. that they can call their friends to come anytime. That's and right. and Absolutely. that friend support is so important for a young person. Yeah. Such a good point about palliative. And, and lots of laughter and oh, s yes. sports talks. And, and <laughs> make sure you have a TV where you can play silly movies yeah. and you know <laughs> yeah. let the person be themselves. 
Yeah. And that reminds me, I was going to close with it, but I want to share it now. Dame Cicely Sanders, who is the palliative care pioneer, she said this, you matter because you are you, and you matter to the end of your life. We will do all we can, not only to help you die peacefully, but to live until you die. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the, uh, the honoring people mm, as right. they're living in the days before they die. Even you said, be careful of your words. You're not dying of cancer, yeah. you're dying with cancer. Yeah, and we're all, we're living, we're yeah, living, you're with, living cancer, with cancer, yeah, not yeah. dying. We are, um, our words matter. And so on that note, I want to share um, some things that uh, we, we <laughs> talked about and put together a little list of tips to help you. I'm all for practical tips because friends, I need them. These are our, our list of tips of things not to say, okay? Make sure you hear this heading. Do not say these things. We'll give you some other ideas, but these are the do not say. I know just exactly what you're going through. Mm -hmm. I know just exactly what you're feeling. It's just like when I mm -hmm. don't make it about you. Don't say God picks the best apples from the tree mm. or <laughs> it's for the best. They're in a better place. Oh, you should be just glad they didn't suffer. <laughs> You're handling this so well. You'll be better in a few months. Just say nothing if you're going to say those That's things. Right. Just say nothing if you don't know yeah. what to say. But what you can say is their name, who they meant to you, how they made you feel, stories about their life, share memories, and listen. Try not to say the things that really don't help. That's right. And as I promised, I am going to take the best of the collective wisdom here that we can pull together as we get ready to wrap. These are Jody's top 10 tips from the ladies. Number one, remember to laugh. There's still joy in living. Find it and giggle about it. That's Laughter right. is good for the soul. You don't laugh at the person. Mm -hmm. You laughed with, with them. them. And maybe some things you're trying to solve are really <laughs> funny. <laughs> There you go. Keep laughing. Make your visits short. Mm -hmm. Keep the number of your visitors small. And if you stop in for a visit, <laughs> don't let the caregiver care for you. Maybe bring the meal to care for them instead. Mm -hmm. That would be helpful. Be a problem solver. Like Gloria said earlier, it takes a lot of creativity and creative thinking. Be a problem solver. Let your loved one do all they can. Let them live all they can while they can. Let them be involved in everything they can. Number seven, get the younger members of the family involved too. Mm -hmm. There's so much they can learn and there's so much they can offer right. in the situation. Don't box them out. And number eight, get out of the house. Go for a drive. Enjoy, enjoy what you can. Number nine, Keep the important things written down, like Carol said. <laughs> Don't count on your memory. Doesn't matter how old you are. And number 10, you know your person best. Advocate for them. Speak up. Overrule if you need to. You know your loved one the best. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's the wisdom shared from me, pulled from these two. And now, as we get ready for our Q&A before we wrap up tonight, I do want to let you know of an incredible resource. You guys were impressed oh, with this. Very, very. My, it's got my, everything on it. My yeah. daughter actually spent some time working as a social worker in palliative care, and she put together, I think, this eight-page resource, and it covers everything from financial to after-death resources. Let me see here. We got medical needs, transportation, programs you never knew existed, accommodations, dental care, a full directory of names and numbers that you'll need, and all kinds of pricing and addresses and information. We would be happy to get this in your hands. All you have to do, if you're watching on YouTube, just go on our website and contact us and you can ask for it and I'll make sure you get it. If you're watching on Facebook, simply throw down a comment. I want the resource and I'll be able to inbox you back with a private message and get your information to send it to you. And I think I forgot to say social worker on our team. Oh, 
very important part of it. So we love our social Sorry, workers. <laughs> we love you, Lexi. <laughs> Thanks for this uh, resource. And really, this is an awesome resource for any family. So reach out and we would be happy to get that into your hands. And now we have a couple of questions I think we're going to take for this one. The first question is the best advice for family members trying to juggle work, family, and being a caregiver. Good question. The juggling act, right? Mm -hmm. Who wants to take that one? Gloria does. <laughs> <laughs> Guess he's got to speak quick. Let me Gloria, think. what kind of advice for the person who has a lot to juggle? Well, if you have a family member that you can ask to come in and take your place for your mm -hmm. period of time while you're at work, mm -hmm. that works. Or there are people in the community that you can hire yes. to yeah. come in and take your place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think what I heard you guys through my listening and in that kind of context, because I would feel it would be a lot to juggle if it mm -hmm. came to me, it is. would be just be willing to ask for help. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of resources. <laughs> And don't let the guilt or the lie kind of come on you that it's all me, it's up to me, I have, that's false. So kind of throw that off right. and just be bold and ask and find the help that you need. And you'll find that you have many neighbors that are so helpful. Yeah, people mm -hmm. want to help. Maybe just coming in and taking your loved one out. Okay, we have another question. How do you deal with the heartbreak and exhaustion at the end of a particularly rough day? Hmm. Well, you would just have a little tear, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. Have a shower. There you go. <laughs> no, I, Cup of tea. I, I think the same as anybody else. Like mm -hmm. anybody who's exhausted, you do the same things. You sit down, have a cup of tea, talk to a friend maybe, mm -hmm. and um, know that tomorrow's a different day and it'll get better. So That's right. mm -hmm. I think that would be my, my two cents worth on that. And my, my two cents is be careful as much as you can not to keep yourself right at the edge of the cliff where you're always on the cliff of exhaustion that right. anything can kind of push you over mm. keep taking care of yourself the self-care things that you need to do mm -hmm. the help that you need um so that when it does happen you know you, you you can pull into the supports but try not to uh i think we we live maxed i i know that has been my experience right and uh so i'm learning to live you know less close to the edge when you, when you feel that you have um, overused your family and your neighbors and so mm -hmm. forth, um, our, our um, nursing homes have mm -hmm. a room That's set right. aside for respite mm -hmm. so that your loved one can go there for mm -hmm. a few days mm -hmm. so you can just plain have a sleep. Yeah. <laughs> Sleep. I remember you told me that when one time you used it and you were like, I just wanted to sleep. Mm -hmm. Sleep, sleep, sleep. I'm like, I think I could use some of those days. <laughs> Is there respite for other people <laughs> for no reason? <laughs> we'll put you in next week. <laughs> okay. I could just use a few days of sleep. But that's good. Really good. Is it, Was there any other questions that we missed? We got them all? All right. Well, um, I hope that you enjoyed our, our time, but before we wrap, I almost forgot, I'm going to give each of these ladies a chance to offer you one last word of encouragement. I'll start with you, Gloria. If you could take the person listening in there after all we talked about tonight and kind of sum up a word of encouragement, what would you, what would you say to them? I think I would say that um, as the years progress ahead, you will look back and think, what a privilege I had. Hmm. I had a privilege to um, help that elderly parent or a spouse or a grandchild or someone. I had a little wee part in making their day a bit better. Wow. That's wonderful. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> and I, I would agree with that because every time you're with a patient, well, in my case, I will say patient, and no, I'm not going to say family right now who is dying and you have the privilege of being there with them, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's probably no mm -hmm. greater gift. Mm -hmm. And people will say to you, how do you do that day after mm -hmm. day? And you might have three or four deaths in a day, but it doesn't take away from you. It gives you something. That's right. Mm -hmm. you have, you've been there with that mm -hmm. person and of course you want to be there. You've helped them through the journey. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, that's one of the probably the biggest privileges that you can have Absolutely. is mm -hmm. to be there and see somebody from mm -hmm. this the onset till the end mm -hmm. and um, 
and the one thing I wrote down here is the care of the the, uh, the secret of the care of the patient and the family is the caring of them, that oh. you love them. Mm -hmm. So that's oh. the secret. It's no big deal to care for them because you love them so much. Mm -hmm. And when you lose somebody, you realize that the reason you're grieving so much is because you've loved so much. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow, I told you, you were in for a treat tonight. And if you got just even a little tidbit of all that I have been blessed in these conversations, your life will be richer for it. We do these community learnings, just as a final thought tonight. We do them because we believe it's important to learn to love each other. We want to love and honor those who have so much loved and cared for us. And so learning how to do it and talking about it and knowing there's help and seeing a little um, possibility, it's, it's a great investment of our time. Thank you, Carol, for sharing with us. Thank you, Gloria. Make sure in the comments that you send them some love. Don't forget to ask, uh, ask for the resource if you would like a copy. Thank you for joining us tonight. We hope that this was certainly a, a little blessing and a little help as you consider the, the day and the time when you will have to care for someone that you love. Thanks and good night. Good night. Good night.